Contrastive learning is a beautiful idea. It asks the simple question, are two signals the same or different? It can be used to distinguish between similar and dissimilar things. And the key idea is that distinguishing is more important than complete reconstruction. I want to tell you a little secret. Unsupervised learning, specifically self-supervised learning, is going to be the next big thing. Oh, no, wait a minute. I tell a lie. It's already the biggest game in town. Why tell the machines what to learn? Doing so limits their representational capacity, and it also stops them from learning global and local features. We could learn much better representations with self-supervision because there's almost no limit to the amount of data that we can generate. There's quite a few things that we're talking about here other than reinforcement learning. There's this concept of contrastive learning, transfer learning, data augmentation and self-supervision. Uh, the first time I came across contrastive learning was the SkipGram model by Mikhailov in 2013. The first version of his algorithm had a softmax output space or a hierarchical softmax output space across the entire vocabulary. What he was trying to do was to predict the next word you know, in, in a sequence of words. But the really clever trick that he did to improve the computational performance of his algorithm was to do this contrastive output with a negative sampling. So a positive sample would be two words that are in the context of each other, and a negative sample would be um, a word and some other random word from the corpus. And then this is a self-supervision task, so you can just generate you know, lots and lots of pairs of words, and you can learn an internal representation which will project words into a geometric space where words that are often in the context of each other would be you know, ge geometrically similar. So all of the first names would be um, close to each other. And of course, then we get into the transfer learning thing, because these um, embeddings that you've pre-trained on a self-supervision task could be used for downstream tasks. It's reasonably easy to come up with a self-supervised task for language processing, but how do we do the same thing for computer vision? A similar um, thing here where there was a contrastive loss for learning image embeddings was the FaceNet paper. And that used a triplet loss, which has an anchor, a positive and a negative, and it has a margin as well. And um, you could make the algorithm converge faster by having a mining strategy, which would select an anchor and a positive, which were as dissimilar as possible. So the algorithm was, was learning. But that still needed annotations. You still needed to know whether or not the person was the same person. Person. Well, I first became aware of this in, in about June of last year when I interviewed Devon Yelm for his Deep Infomax paper, and he was using data augmentations um, in computer vision as a self-supervision task. So we have SimCLR and we have MoCo, which we'll talk about today. And essentially what they do is they, they take a whole bunch of different augmentations, so let's just say cutouts for the time being, and the self-supervision task is to ask the algorithm, do these cutouts belong in the same image? And what fascinates me about this so much is that you can actually learn even better representations from unsupervised approaches than you can from supervised approaches. The paper we're going to talk about today is CURL, Contrastive Unsupervised Representations for Reinforcement Learning by Srinivas et al. Curl talks about getting state-of-the-art performance on um, playing Atari games using reinforcement learning. And you might recall um, this from the DeepMind paper. So the, the setup is very similar. You use four frames from an Atari game and, and you train a reinforcement learning algorithm just using the pixels. What's different, though, in, in this paper is uh, Srinivas is really interested in sample efficiency. Rather than looking for that asymptotic you know, performance at about a million uh, iterations, we're looking for any time performance, which is giving us a really strong benchmark at 100K. In the original DeepMind paper, they needed over a million iterations to get the algorithm to converge. And the sample efficiency problem is one of the key reasons why reinforcement learning algorithms are not being used in the real world today. Curl is the first model-free reinforcement learning pipeline uh, with contrastive learning to get state-of-the-art performance on complex tasks. Uh, Curl also allows the deployment of reinforcement learning into domains where sample efficiency is important. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you back next week. Um, so, um, uh, so welcome, folks. We've got Aravind uh, Srinivas uh, on, on the show today.
And uh, Aravind um, was uh, an intern at DeepMind last year, and uh, he's a member of the technical staff at OpenAI. He was a visiting researcher at the Montreal Institute of Learning and Algorithms, and uh, he's currently completing his uh, PhD uh, at Berkeley. Uh, he's got a dual degree, a, a BS and an MS in electrical engineering from the Indian uh, Institute of Technology um, uh, from Madras. And um, we're really, really excited about having Aravind uh, on the show because Aravind's really, really interested in um, unsupervised learning. And Aravind recently released a, a paper which is getting loads and loads of traction in the community at the moment called Curl. Uh, Aravind, would, would you like to introduce your paper? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, we, we, we just released this paper called Curl, uh, Contrast to Unsupervised Representations for Reinforcement Learning. Uh, so the the idea there is to uh, use this very recently popular form of uh, self or unsupervised learning called contrastive learning uh, to be data efficient on the uh, reinforcement learning task. Uh, this is uh, pretty much inspired from uh, my work at DeepMind where uh, we actually improve the data efficiency of supervised learning systems using contrastive learning uh, in this paper called uh, Data Efficient Image Recognition from CPC, uh, uh, where basically we showed results uh, that you can be 50% uh, to 80% more data efficient on um, uh, regular supervised learning on ImageNet if you do pre-training on the unlabeled data and then fine-tune to the uh, labeled data. Uh, so uh, data efficiency is uh, super, like, like it's the most important goal uh, right now because we all know that deep learning or reinforcement learning works when you have a lot of labeled data or a lot of uh, agent experiences. Uh, so the, 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 the thing that mo uh, almost everybody is interested in right now is to uh, how, how can we create systems that are as, as good in terms of performance uh, but 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 it can learn with 10x or 100x fewer samples, right? So uh, and 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 people believe that uh, self or unsupervised learning is the way to way to do that because uh, you learn a lot more about your data that way. Uh, for instance, if you are just trying to uh, optimize a reward function or just predict the labels, uh, you don't learn as much about the data you have as compared to like actually. Uh, trying to understand or make sense of what is present in your raw pixels or raw observations. So, uh, and data efficiency is even more critical in control or reinforcement learning setups because um, we want the agents to actually uh, operate in real time in the real world. At some point, we want RL to work in the real world. So, uh, for that, we, we need RL to work fast. That's the most important thing. Um, and so, we, 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 we thought like we could just apply this contrast learning there. And uh, since my time at DeepMind, contrast learning has also gone through a lot of changes. Uh, we, while we were working with the CPC framework, uh, things got a lot simpler recently with uh, timing his uh, MoCo paper, uh, Momentum Contrast Learning, and uh, the paper from Google Brain Toronto, Ting Chen and Jeff Hinton uh, on Sim, uh, called SimClear. Uh, where the idea, idea of extracting patches from an image was uh, uh, was ignored, and like people started working with just instance level discrimination tasks uh, that made implementation a lot simpler and uh, it's it's much more elegant, and and also produces better numbers. So uh, so we took that form of contrast learning and added it as an auxiliary task in uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and, and this speeds up the sample efficiency of reinforcement learning systems significantly. And not only that, uh, it's extremely simple to implement. Uh, like in the past, there have been works that have used, tried to use auxiliary tasks to speed up reinforcement learning setups. Uh, like, like, like there is this paper from DeepMind uh, three to four years ago called Unreal uh, Unsuper Reinforcement Learning Unsupervised Auxiliary Tasks from Max Yatterberg. Um, which is actually uh, one of the first papers to show some kind of sample efficiency gains on RL, with, with, but, but where they try to predict things like the future frame in the in the task. But but that involves using an autoencoder like setup. You're trying to actually predict the pixels or patches, or like uh, they, they they frame it as a value function task, but it's still pretty complicated. Uh, we thought that you know uh, all these. Uh, 
reconstruction-based tasks can be done away with, uh, given all the latest progress in contrastive learning, and it turned out to be true. And uh, e even though it's like better than the existing methods, the most important thing is it's uh, vastly simpler. So uh, it's like a few lines of extra code, and it can be plugged in place into anything, any 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 R algorithm. So that was the major motivation for me to do this work. That's really, really cool. I mean, there, there are so many, uh, you know, we're holding so many doors open simultaneously at the moment, so we might have to close one at a time. But just to come back to the reinforcement learning part first, uh, you said that there's a kind of crisis in reinforcement learning at the moment, you know, which is the sample efficiency problem. And when you finished your coal uh, paper, you kind of said that it allows deployments of, of reinforcement learning into uh, domains where sample efficiency is important. Because I think the original DeepMind paper had something like, uh, well, it, it was in the millions of iterations in order to converge and one of the things that surprised me at the time is the DeepMind paper didn't include the raw physical state version it didn't show uh, what the difference was from you know using the raw physical features and and, and the pixels uh, I should say I should clarify that uh, when the, the original Unreal paper was published uh, the DeepMind control benchmarks did not exist uh, so that, that benchmark was created by them just a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, so uh, I think they, they focused on experiments in uh, DeepMind Lab, which is a navigation task, and Atari. So so that that way, I wouldn't say they, they didn't intentionally show it or something. Uh, and uh, I think I think I think it was still old olden days in our at the time, like. People still believed in this, like learning for 200 million steps. If you look at those that paper, they mainly focus on getting better numbers at the asymptotic performance rather than actually focusing on learning in 100,000 steps or comparing to having access to ground truth state. Uh, yeah. But since we've had so much success there, I think we are now slowly veering towards like uh, the faster learning benchmarks. Well, so, sorry, Connor. Yeah, I had a question about the 100,000 uh, interaction step kind of metric for benchmarking, benchmarking data efficiency with these reinforced learning algorithms. Because when you have like a world model that with the variational autoencoder that samples some inputs and then learns how to reconstruct the space and then you can sample trajectories in your world model, like, so I don't think the interac interaction step is a fair comparison when you have something like curl that's only model free, no world model, every interaction is in the real world compared with like planet and dreamer where they can learn in the latent space. So I think that kind of difference between model based and model free reinforcement learning makes the 100K inter interaction step kind of uh, metric a bit odd to use. Uh, so one, I, I would say that the model-based methods are likely to be uh, like you would you would you would want to, you would expect them to be much better in terms of sample efficiency. Uh, but uh, I would also say that uh, they add some level of complexity to your to your pipeline. Uh, like like the moment you start dealing with things like predicting the future in a latent space. Uh, you, you, you're changing the architecture a bit, and you need to figure out how many steps you want to predict into the future. Uh, so, in spite of not doing that, that's the main thing. In spite of not doing any of that, we are still better than those methods. And so that means that once we add things like time-based models, uh, like predicting the future, we are, we are going to be even better, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and 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 so uh, that, that that's 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 the main thing I want to highlight. It's in spite of being model free, uh, it's 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 getting a lot lot better. <laughs> well, one more question I had is about these auxiliary tasks and where your the uh, observation O goes to Q through the momentum contrast encoder, and then it's also being updated with the reinforced learning gradients. So, if you added a future predicting model as well, say you know predicting Q representations like Planet or Dreamer, it's not trying to reconstruct the pixel space. How, how complicated is this multitask optimization? Are each of these different tasks, the contrastive self-supervised learning, the Q learning, you know, soft actor critic, soft actor critic, and then the uh, predict the future model, are they going to all just pull the gradients in such different ways that it becomes challenging to optimize the Q? Good question. Um, so if you look at the contrastive loss, it, it's, it's basically like a classification task. It, it is like a classification loss. Uh, 
and, and like if you look at Moco or Simclear, uh, you can consider the task as something like I have the anchor and I have a bunch of images. One is the true uh, label, the positive, and the rest are negatives. So that's like a K, K class classification task. So because it's a classification task, the loss is much more well behaved. It's, the cross entropy loss is well bounded, well behaved, and it's 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 not it's not going to do, uh, dominate your uh, reinforcement learning loss. So it it it, it go it plays nicely with the RL loss. Hmm. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing something like predicting the future in latent space or in the pixel space, uh, let's say you're doing pixel space predictions, you're you're then actually having something like a mean square RL loss on the pixels. And there are so many bits to optimize there. Uh, if your pixel dimension is really high, like say you're actually operating in like 84 by 84, uh, then that loss starts to dominate your reinforcement learning loss. And so you need to figure out the right hyperparameter to balance that objective with the RL objective. So if you look at all these papers like soft uh, soft data critic with autoencoder or like planet or dreamer, you would notice like there are some kind of uh, hyperparameters to control this, to make sure that the model still learns fast. Uh, in our paper, we don't have that. Uh, we just, we have like no hyperparameter controlling the two objectives, they just, very neatly play with each other. And I think this is a property of contrastive that doesn't exist with other models. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you were to predict in the latent space, it's still going to be a high dimensional prediction. Uh, just because you made it latent doesn't mean that uh, you're, you're, you're actually having a much smaller loss. Uh, you, you, because you would still deal with continuous vectors and predicting the future in the continuous vectors is still, you, it depends on whatever model you use. If you use some kind of a mixture density network, uh, you would still have some Gaussian log likelihood loss. And it's not it's not lower bounded at all. Uh, so the, the KL in the Gaussian is not, there's no lower bound for it. So so that's that's why using, so, so at a general level, the, the more loss functions you have that look more like supervised learning, by supervised learning, I mean classification, the easier and easier and simpler your life is, hmm. and 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 this contrastive loss is one such loss. It, it it is exactly like supervised learning. You're creating labels for free by creating these proxy uh, anchor positive negative tasks, and uh, therefore it, it behaves it, 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 like like it's it's a much better choice if you're, if you're concerned with multi-objective optimization. So I had, s sorry. Um, I had I had a question ab about this because if you think about yes, it's true that the classification loss is is much more easy, but also there is much less information in simply a a classification into whatever positive and negative anchors than there is from reconstructing pixels. So one would assume that kind of reconstructing pixels would give you a much uh, at least ri informationally richer. Um, richer representation right uh, when you compare the, the the contrast representation with the reconstructive representation none of them none of them have in mind the task you're trying to solve right none of them have this rl task in mind both are completely unsupervised how do you what do you think is the the matter even though that basically you have much more information in the reconstruction uh, it seems to be that the contrast representation seems to be much more effective. Uh, so, so the, that's a great question. Um, I think I think the best way to think about it is what what is the most useful information. Uh, it's not about the number of bits uh, because not all bits are created equal. Uh, so, if you look at the like like say you look at Atari or Majoko, what do you care about as the agent, right? There are so many things in the background that you, like for instance, if you looked at these Walker or Cheetah, there's all this uh, background, like the floor and the the what the the background of the agent, or like uh, or, or in Atari, there's these texture patterns. Like these don't actually matter because uh, they are not going to help you solve the task better. Uh, whereas a pixel prediction task doesn't know that. It's just trying. It's just going to try to predict everything. And this has always been the biggest challenge in uh, unsupervised learning. Like, how can we get objectives that naturally focus on the things that we care about? 
um, without actually knowing what we care about. Because pre-training does not necessarily have to know like what 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 is the task you're trying to perform or what is the downstream labels or whatever. But it should still be able to learn only the useful aspects of the world. And I think before contrastive learning, we never had an answer to that. And I'm not saying we have nailed the problem. It, it, it depends on how far contrastive learning can go, but it, do, it definitely seems like uh, contrastive learning has figured out a great solution to this problem. Uh, if you look at, like for instance, look at Simplier, um, like, like you're focusing on two different data augmentations of a dog and you're trying to associate them uh, compare, like, but, but just as a classification task. So if, if, if you are trying to perform this task, what, what, how would you go about it? Like you would immediately say like, hey, these legs look like it's, it's this, uh, it's, it belongs to the same creature. So then you start focusing on the legs or like, let's say if the random crop covered the face of the dog, but not the body, then you would focus on, oh, like, you know, this, this is like, a, the, the, this looks like a dog's face. And you, you, you start looking at these important details, high level details. Uh, whereas uh, if you're just trying to learn a version order encoder of, of, of dogs, you're looking, you're, you're trying to focus on everything, like the background of the dog, the sky, the like all those pixels are as important as the pixels of the dog's face, right? So the model doesn't know like what to focus on. So uh, and 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 it's a great uh, it's it it it's a it's a great outcome of contrast learning. I would say it's been the grand goal of unsupervised learning to focus on the most important aspects, uh, and somehow contrast learning seems to be able to do that really well. A follow up: Is it maybe fair to say that? let's say the magic isn't so much in the fact that we do this contrastive learning, but the magic is that we are with contrastive learning, we're able to just come up with much better objectives, right? But it's still, we still need to, it still seems to be important that, you know, we actually do this cropping and, and things like this, like if our task, we can't just plug in any old task, like it, it still seems to be very important what the task is. Is that fair to say? Or That's, that's very fair to say. Uh, okay. But 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 you, uh, one thing I would say is um, like like uh, unless you provide those kind of fundamental invariances in your data to, in your data to the uh, to the model or the agent, uh, it's very hard to be sample efficient, right? Um, so look at supervised learning. That's the only thing that's majorly worked in 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 uh, in, in, in deep learning, uh, and and so you are using all these ideas there. Like random crop is the most important data augmentation in ImageNet uh, or, or even like cocoa or detection or segmentation. Uh, and, and that boosts the performance of systems by a lot, well, vast margin. So yeah. it's it, unsuper uh, So how do you do that without labels is the question. And so uh, unsupervised learning lets you do that uh, through this form of learning called contrast learning. Um, but 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 you're right. Like we need to be. It's it's very domain dependent. For images, it's fine. But let's say you move to something like language, it's not clear what kind of data augmentations to use there. Um, so you would have to do things like predicting the future, which is more like CPC framework. Um, so so instance discrimination is somewhat limited to computer vision or like dealing just. And uh, so so you're right. Like it. it Performance, like like in general, it's always like if you want really good numbers uh, with, with a much smaller model or like a model that just learns really fast, uh, you need to bake in more more information into it. Tim had made a joke before we started recording about uh, having a paper and then taking the different paragraphs out and telling if it's in the same paper. So kind of an idea of how you would generalize like a contrast of loss into the text data domain. So like, I'm just curious about the construction of these uh, positive negative pairs and kind of like, so let's say you form the positive pairs with like T minus one and T plus one are the positive pairs of T and then every other frame is negative. Like, how do you see the role of data augmentation compared to maybe like a time way of constructing the positive negative pairs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think you need to still use data augmentation. 
uh, if you look at our CPC free, uh, paper from DeepMind, uh, the data, data efficient image recognition with CPC, we do time-based or space-based predictions. Like we take the patch at the top row and predict the bottom bottom rows patches. Uh, but we still use a lot of data augmentation there. So you need to do both. And it's counterintuitive. You'll be like, hey, if I'm just predicting the future or like I'm just predicting spatially uh, adjacent things, why should I do data augmentations? Uh, it, 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 it's a bit hard to understand. It's more like you're, you're, you're maximizing the mutual information between these two entities in some sense. And to do that efficiently, you, you need to use a lot of augmentations or else the information shared is too high and the model starts cheating. Uh, but uh, potentially, if you want to extend curl to something like time-based curl, where you're predicting from t minus one to t or t plus one, and you're trying to like say this is the right t plus one for this t minus one, and everything else is fake, you would still have to use data augmentations to get yeah. the state-of-the-art performance. But even if you don't use data augmentations, I would expect something useful to happen there. Uh, That's that's really interesting. I mean, I suppose it might be worth saying that one of the interesting things about reinforcement learning is that um, the, the IID assumption isn't true because you know there, there's a there's strong correlation between the successive frames. But um, again, there are, there are so many different topics that we're touching on here. It's quite hard for me to kind of bring a narrative together because I'm, I'm slightly worried that um, so some of our listeners might um, not be experts in machine learning. So we should provide a little bit of context. I mean, <clears throat> one thing I'm interested in is is this concept, as you were saying, that these augmentations can allow you to learn um, global and local features. And we're actually moving towards this um, this situation now where unsupervised representations can actually be even better than supervised representations. So I, I want to explore that. But I also want to cover the history a little bit about um, contrastive learning, because I think the key idea is that distinguishing between things is actually more important than having the kind of representational power to create something from scratch. And the, the, um, the, 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 there's a few different concepts here. So there's this idea of transfer learning. There's this idea of self-supervision. There's this idea of data augmentation and coming up with, um, you know, semantically relevant um, uh, tasks that would allow you to, sorry, that's my time. Stop. I, I've, I've said a 30 minute timer so that, um, okay, Google, shut up. I'm so, I'm so sorry about that. Um, Okay, so we'll we'll cut that bit out. But um, but the, I think the the first instance of transfer learning and uh, self supervision that was super interesting for me was um, the skip ground model by Mikolov, and that 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 was a similar thing, right? Because the first version of it actually had a, a softmax output space across the entire vocabulary, and it was kind of computationally intractable. And then they did this wonderful idea. They said, you know, let let's have a kind of contrastive loss. And what they did was they um, uh, they came up with I don't want to use the word augmentation, but they, you know they were saying does this word belong in the context of the other word? And the model was learning a kind of semantic equivalence or linguistic equivalence as a basis of how close the words are. Um, but at this point, we weren't really um, doing uh, perturbations. And then there was a similar concept with the FaceNet paper, so that had a contrastive loss, and that was using the the margin based triplet loss. And there was a kind of negative sampling strategy where you would make the model model converge quicker if you could find uh, you know you had like an anchor and a positive and a negative and you would try and find um, an anchor and a positive which was as dissimilar as possible uh, you know to, to make the, the model learn um, so there are so many examples of this and then um, sim CLR I, I kind of see as being the the canonical example in, in vision I mean there, there was also deep info max by Devin Yellman and a few other similar papers but we, we're really starting to see this hitting the the computer vision world now yeah that's right uh yeah, it's a great point you made with Word2Vec. Um, the, uh, I would say contrastive predictive coding, uh, CPC, is basically uh, Word2Vec done for images. Uh, where instead of words, uh, you look at patches in an image and you're trying to predict the surrounding patch from your uh, given patch or like top patches from the bottom, bottom from the top, left to right, right to left, different directions. So uh, it, it, for me, it was like, oh, oh damn, like Convec is working on images as well. And uh, that, that was like the most exciting thing to me about contrastive learning for images. Uh, uh, it's like this uh, word is kind of coming back in a different form. 
Uh, though in NLP, people are moved beyond word to act now. Like like BERT is really the way to go for NLP uh, compared to uh, you know like skip gram or like skip thoughts kind of models. Um, but 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 in computer vision, I think you can't do that. You can't do things like BERT because it's it's too hard to predict the pixels. You, you may be able to do something. You may be able to have some kind of reasonable, reasonably good looking results. Uh, I'm sure people will do that, but I think it's hard to be contrasted there. Uh, but yeah, to, to specifically to your question, uh, the best way to understand the success of these contrastive models is like thinking about it in the same context as word to back. And what about this concept that, um, because I think that one of the major things in in SimCLR was that for the first time, um, even on ImageNet, for example, it was producing state-of-the-art results. So um, could, could you give us some intuition on why that might be? So so SimClear, uh, so, so there are like multiple benchmarks for super unsupervised free training on on, on, on images. Uh, so the one thing is linear classification, which is you take your model, uh, you freeze the features and you put a linear classifier on top and you see how good that, that linear classifier uh, performs uh, compared to just regular supervised learning. It's more of an academic test. It, it does not have much practical value except the fact that uh, you could potentially just store features instead of images if you're like a company like Facebook or Google where you have a lot of image data and you can't afford to store each of them. Uh, so so that's the, one year ago, the best number of, on that metric was 55%. And right now it's 77%. So in just a matter of a year, uh, it, it has gone up by 22%. So, well, so I... It, I uh, I, yeah, when I started my internship at DeepMind, uh, we were like, okay, let's let's just get seventy percent. That would be amazing. Uh, and and we didn't get there. Like when we released the contrastive predictive coding version two paper in December, uh, we got to seventy one percent. And then Simplier took it to a whole new level. Moco was taken again to a whole new level now, um, by even using even smaller architectures and getting there. So uh, that's one metric. The other metric is uh, if you if you do this pre-training, what, what can you do with those features? Uh, can you do transfer learning? Um, so you can take you can just like supervised learning, you can take the backbone that you use in pre-training and put it in a downstream task like object detection. And uh, that's that's there's been a test called the Pascal. Pascal uh, walked data set uh, where, where you use, there's not a lot of label data there. So you do need a good backbone to get good good numbers there. And there has been a general consensus till, till the last few months that self-supervised pre-training was never as good as supervised pre-training. It was always like few few percentage points worse. So if you look at this Berkeley professor's website, uh, Alyosha Ifro's website, uh, he, has a, he has a thing called the gelato bet uh, that he made with uh, this computer vision pioneer, Jitendra Malik, that self-supervised pre-training could never equal or surpass supervised uh, pre-training, which is you, you, you just take all the image net labels, you train a classifier, and you use that as your backbone compared to you do unsupervised pre-training, no labels, and use that as your backbone. Uh, both are compared on the same Pascal Pascal test. And till, till MoCo and CPC version two, uh, this was never, like like unsupervised pre-training was always worse. And then finally, uh, unsupervised pre-training got better than supervised pre-training on this, on this benchmark. Uh, so that, 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 that was like the first signs of life on the transfer learning setup. And on the third thing is uh, fine tuning to the same data set, which is, uh, okay, like, let's say you have all the labels, let's say you're a startup, you have like a lot of label data. Why would I care? Like, like you, could, you could ask that. Uh, and it turns out that you do pre-training and then you fine tune that model to just for classifying. So you have ImageNet, you have all the labels, but ignore the labels first. Do 
do unsupervised pre-training and then take that and fine tune to all the legal data you have. So it turns out that surpasses supervised learning now. So if you look at our CPC version two paper, on when, when you have the 100% of the labels, you have all the labels, all the 1 million labels, you get 83.2% top one accuracy com compared to 80% uh, top one accuracy of regular supervised learning, just by doing the pre-trained plus fine tune setup. What what happens? Can you can you combine that? Sorry, can you combine that with your loss? Um, I mean, so, sorry for interrupting you. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you could potentially com you sh you could potentially combine the two losses, and and that's a good idea. Uh, we 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 didn't try that, but I, I would imagine that to work reasonably well. Um, but um, yeah, I've I've heard of people trying it. Like, not, nothing has been really published yet in terms of a good good number. But uh, pre-trained this fine tune seems like a better thing to do because um, you could imagine potentially having hundred x more unlabeled data than labeled data, right? So, um, um, as a quick question, I mean, could you give us any intuition on which variables are important here? Because um, I could just be cynical and say, oh, it, it's the amount of data that's important. Because with these auxiliary tasks, you can generate a seemingly infinite amount of data, uh, as we do in these language models. I mean, Microsoft just released Project Turing, which is a language model that has, uh, it's in the billions of parameters. And uh, I, I know that um, Yannick is a bit cynical, because you can ask it, uh, you know, who won the Second World War, and or when was the Second World War over? And, and it would you don't know whether it's memorizing it or not but um but when you have supervised um uh, problems you can um have many many annotations and many different types of label and on ImageNet, for example there, there might be a phenomenon that exists in all of the images that was not accounted for with a label so um surely that would not be learned by the machine learning model but it would be learned if you did an unsupervised task so what, what's important and what's not important um so most important thing is to train for a really long time. Um, Self-supervised learning, if you look at any of these papers, uh, if you, let, just take a look at Simclear. Uh, they train for 1,000 epochs uh, for all the data efficiency gains on 1%, 10% image net. So that's a crazy long time to train. Uh, supervised learning is usually trained for 90 epochs. So you could ask like, hey, what if I do supervised learning for 1,000 epochs too? You wouldn't get the same kind of gains you get from unsupervised pre-training. Uh, we I mean, like it's not being published, but we, we've actually tried such things. Um, so, so that means that uh, unsupervised uh, pre-training is the, like, like it, it is because it learns a lot more about your data set, it, it needs more time to train, but because it trains for sufficiently long time, it, it ends up creating more value for you. Um, well, no. Yeah, sorry. Another trend I saw in the SimClear paper is that as you scale up the width multiplier, you get huge gains. Like the 76% 76 uh, accuracy, that's the 4x width multiplier. But if you go down to the ResNet 50, you know, it, even MoCo2 is like 71. So scaling up the size of the model, is I think that was one of the big key ideas in SimClear is that as you scale up the model size, they really benefit from doing that. So my question then is, if you're trying to apply that idea into reinforcement learning, is how big of a bottleneck would it be to take a ResNet 50 with a 4x width multiplier and be constantly using that to map from the observation just into the latent representation, then it goes through the Q function. Like that, I know the recent paper is like thinking while moving. That's like the hot paper now is trying to get around this pipeline where you have to like see it, think, act, you know, like how big of a like reinforce and learning agents, they seem to need to be able to go from observation to representation, like way faster. So do you think some kind of neural architecture search, like how do you think these big models can be adapted for reinforcement learning or is that really important at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me let me separate it into two parts. Uh, the first part that you mentioned, that width is so useful in self-supervised pre-training on images. Uh, that, that's something I was going to say as well. Uh, like like to the earlier question on what is what is the most important thing, uh, like like 
training really long was one important thing. The other important thing was m- making the models wider or like deeper or like both. And 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 even CPC version two ha- shows that like using very deep big resonances is giving you a lot of gains. And and Simclear again the same thing. The, making the model four x wider helps you a lot. This is not true in supervised learning. In supervised learning, if you make the models deeper or wider, you would get gains, but you wouldn't see the same kind of gains that you see in self-supervised mm-hmm. speed training. So, uh, so, so the second thing is what happens if you apply similar ideas to RL? Uh, I think the main problem in reinforcement learning is the environments are not sufficiently diverse and complicated enough right now for these large models to really matter. Uh, like, look at ImageNet. There are like a million mm-hmm. images. There's so much to learn about the world. Uh, sure, it's inefficient right now. You see every image like a thousand times at least to learn something. But uh, if you look at Atari, the environments are sufficiently simple. Like, the, even, even if you learn on all the possible Atari games, uh, you're not actually going to have as much diversity as like million labels on ImageNet. Uh, and, 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 and unsupervised training can even be applied to like even bigger data sets like Instagram. Uh, so unless we have that kind of visual diversity that we see in a data set like ImageNet or Instagram for reinforcement learning, uh, I wouldn't imagine these kind of model scaling to actually matter over there. Uh, but 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 one kind of scaling that really helps in RL is scaling the batch sizes, like that's been applied in uh, Starcraft and Dota, where you just train for several days on large batch sizes, like extremely large amount of samples. So Starcraft used a lot of data, uh, but it's a different kind of data, like in the sense that it's not actually images or pixels, it's more structured information, um, like a lot of, uh, you know, you, you're actually operating at the level, uh, entity level there. So, uh, but, but, but StarCraft is one example of a lot of diversity. Um, but I, I would say, uh, unless you collect a lot of like navigation, grasping, manipulation, um, video games, like something like, you know, millions of these things, it's very unlikely for large models to really matter in reinforcement learning. Another another kind of key idea in the paper is that it's doing the continuous control from only pixel inputs and none of these physical state. So when I think of physical state, I think of, say, like the bipedal walking agent in open AI gym where you have like the angular velocity on the hip and knee joints. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important to be able to do control with only pixel inputs and like why we would want to get away from physical state inputs because it, it doesn't seem to me like it would necessarily be so hard to put like four sensors on the robot to have that additional information? Uh, that's a great question. So why would it be very important? Uh, it's important because potentially you would learn, you could learn uh, to pull in experiences from various different robots and various different tasks. And you would want to have a mm-hmm. simple universal uh, input for everything, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say there are like 100 robots, different kind of robots learning in different worlds, different environments, doing different tasks. And you all you have is a camera that records everything. You could still record the sensory motor information, but uh, it's much easier to learn one visual representation across all these different setups. And that needs you to learn from raw pixels. Like there's no other way. And secondly, it, it is it is uh, objectively true that convolutional neural nets are easier to work with than MLPs. So if you look at our numbers on some of the benchmarks, uh, the pixel-based curl method actually outperforms even the state based on some environments. So yeah. It's actually not upper bounded by the state 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 based RL. In principle, it can actually be even better. So that, that, that those are the two main reasons. Like you know, like state based is something you design yourself. Like you say, hey, okay, like you know these are the variables that matter. And sometimes that plays a big role. For instance, if you're doing something like a reacher task, 
if you give relative distances instead of absolute distances, or if you instead of joint angles, if you give sinusoids of the joint angles, your sample efficiency is way better. Because these MLPs are like finicky and they just work if you uh, reparameterize your inputs in a better format. But you don't want to be yeah. doing this kind of domain engineering for every new task. Uh, if you just provide the pixels, the model is going to figure out anyway. All the information is there. So that I, I think in principle, when it starts working really well, we'll all move to that format. Have you... Uh, sorry. Um, have you ever have you ever tried to recover these uh, true state variables from the the representation that you learn for something like you know a walker or so? Uh, we're pretty sure that the joints and so on are the correct variables to 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 feed to the RL algorithm, right? So have you? Could you determine how much information about that? Like you may, maybe you predict them from your state. Have you ever tried something like this and you can conclude? yes, it is actually learning the correct variables, or surprisingly, no, it's learning something completely different that still works? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually have an ablation in the paper where we show that um, we can actually predict the information from the from the pixels uh, on, 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 on the easier environments, but on the harder environments like half cheetah, we're not actually able to predict that. Uh, that's one environment where I would say curl is still not there yet in terms of matching the state-based state-based RL method, uh, and uh, that 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 basically means like that uh, you know there's just some some amount of information in the states that you just can't recover from the pixels or representations, um, and and that's potentially hampering the performance when 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 compared to state-based methods. Um, but 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 I would I don't I don't consider it like a, something that cannot be solved. Like it, it's more likely to need like a little more engineering in terms of how you construct the architecture. Um, but that's a great question. Like if you if you are able to recover the information that you fundamentally consider important, like velocity or positions or the pose, uh, it means that you have a good representation. So um, just a couple of uh, just just to kind of riff on that just for a tiny bit more, because you, you were saying that the CNNs can actually produce even better results than the than the state variables, and I mean CNNs are really interesting because um, they are part of the reason why we have deep learning. I mean all of the really deep neural networks um, are CNN networks, and it's because they they have this kind of structure trick and weight sharing and regularization, and they make deep learning uh, you know kind of tractable in some sense. So I, I just wondered whether, whether you had any intuition on on what it is about the the CNNs that that actually could improve. Because the other comment I wanted to make was some of, on on the results. Sometimes you don't get state of the art results uh, that that they're, they're they're not as good, and presumably that's because on those particular games um, the, uh, the 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 physical state was only partially observable. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so regarding CNNs, uh, you're right. Like it, it's just amazing. Uh, it's the right kind of inductive device that seems to work in almost any modality, be it audio, video, uh, sometimes text, uh, RL, pixels, images, every, everywhere. So um, and 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 so in principle, I think it's going to work even better than state. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, we're not state of the art everywhere. Uh, like, uh, like we are worse than state based in some of the other environments. And on some of the environments, we're actually not even able to learn, like humanoid or acrobat, where there's just so much of uh, state information that you get based on dynamics, uh, first order or second order, uh, that, that 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 would just be really really hard to get from a few frames that you just get from for the agent like if you just feed in three or four frames it's really hard but i don't see it as fundamentally limitation it's more like a limitation of the architecture we uh using four frame inputs and a small cnn is is, the, is a limiting factor if you potentially move to an architecture that looks at uh 100 frames or something like that um i i don't think it's going to be a problem 
Yeah, because yeah, I was just having a look at the original DeepMind paper a while ago because they, they do the four-frame stack and then they have several convolutional layers and, and the interim convolutional layers actually have a, an even, because you know, they have more filters than there were um, input frames. So it's almost as if they fan out twice on the time domain and then they have a fully connected layer where the time domain gets collapsed in. But one question I wanted to ask you was was about what you see as being the limitations of CNNs because as good as they are for kind of, you know, tr- translational equivariance, uh, that they they fail in some respects you know they they only support planar manifolds they don't learn to uh, see other symmetries in in data i mean one of the reasons why transformers models are so good arguably is because they can model a kind of hierarchical long-term dependency between tokens in in, in images so uh, you know do, do, do you do you see there being an evolution of of, of different encoders yeah that's good. that's a great question so um yeah, so uh, I think I think CNNs are doing local processing, and so fundamentally they are going to be limited by the amount of uh, global message passing that they can do. Um, you would need to stack a lot of layers for the information to propagate all the way through. And so the other thing is they lack multiplicative interaction that transformers have. Uh, in transformers, you're, whenever you're doing the query key value pair mechanism, you're, you're creating higher order interactions between yours. Uh, inputs and so you're 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 going to be it's just fundamentally working better uh, and uh, so so how to combine this kind of local global information processing is really the biggest question right now uh, architecturally uh, like like in language it's fine to just keep making everything attend to everything else. That seems to work really well, but but you can't afford to do such expensive computation in images. Uh, even if you could fit in like a 64 by 64 image into a transformer, um, it's not going to scale to like a one-hour video, right? So obviously you need more efficient architectures. And um, how to how to combine the local global information processing that general and simple it's like something everybody's thinking about and working on now um but 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 the idea of using self-attention and reinforcement learning is still uh, underexplored and though there have been some papers on it nothing has really shown significant gains um so i i think i think it's it's more like when we have the right kind of environments architectures to explore these things will start actually working in in, in control setups as well well, I think another architecture that's in, interesting for this is like the self-attention GAN, where they just kind of put a self-attention layer kind of interleaved with the convolutional feature maps and that's also like how the big GAN model works so my sort of what I was thinking about now is the difference between like uh, you know these transformer models like the reformer and you know the, the adaptive attention span they're trying to figure out how to get away from that like order L squared attention computation or whatever it is. Like what is the dimensionality of an intermediate image feature map compared to like the query key matrix? Cause I know you usually attend to a sequence of say uh, 4,096 tokens. And then each token, you know, probably has at least 128 dimensions. So you've got a matrix of 496 by 128 compared to these images, which is like what 32 by 32, you know, CFAR 10 or, you know, like, are, isn't it a similar compare? Isn't it actually easier by that sense? Uh, so if you look at something like a self-attention GAN, uh, it only plugs in the self-attention at like a high, at lower resolution than the actual image. So the actual image that these self-attention GANs are generating, like big GANs, they're, they're actually like 512 by 512 or like even bigger. Um, but but you can but that would be like uh, 512 square tokens, right? You you can't afford self attention at that level. So you downsample using a few layers of regular residual con- convolution architectures. You get it to a lower resolution, like 64 by 64, and then you put in self attention there, uh, or, or even 32 by 32. Uh, that 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 that's that we can deal with that. Um, and that seems to be like the current setup right now for how to how to use self attention in images. It's like putting it at the top after a few layers of convolutions, but that's not necessarily the most efficient way. 
uh, because you still are uh, relying on some kind of downsampling mechanisms and you could lose information. Uh, there are some attempts at uh, trying to use self-attention all the way in the models, uh, but, 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 but the gains from those models are still not significant enough for, for us to start using them. Like they, when you do that, the models start getting really slow because we these 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 kernels are not hyper optimized as convolutions, and so there is no reason to start using them at all. Um, but 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 I would imagine that like more work needs to be done there. Architectures are like really hard to like. Usually, the best architectures that kind of stand out are like the results of multiple attempts in different directions, and then someone figures out the right combination of details to make that the rest net or the dense net kind of models, right? So that doesn't exist for self-tension plus convolution yet. So, so I, I, um, I, I want to come back to the contrastive learning a bit, and especially what you said before, which, which I, I think is an outrageous statement, that if I have a data set, a labeled data set, and I pre-train it without the labels and then fine tune it, that works better than if I just use the labels. It, like the reason it is outrageous to me is because for, every, for everyone, it just doesn't make sense, right? Uh, intuitively, how can you have more information um, and and end up with, you know, in a less performant place? So for, that's why I asked, do you combine them? But in, in a more general framework, I kind of want to ask, I remember a time when, when the, the best way to train an MNIST CNN was to do layer-wise unsupervised autoencoder pre-training, right? And that worked better than using labels before we like figured out batch norm. <laughs> and it, it seems just kind of the, the same pattern again, where it, it, like this cannot possibly be the end and the best, right? Can, what, what is your, your opinion on that? Like clearly there's something up. I, I was I was interested in pretty much the same question myself, and I've been trying to make supervised learning even better by uh, trying to add like auto augmentation ops and making the models wider, training longer, like all sorts of tricks. Um, to be honest, it, it's it's not easy to surpass this unsupervised pre-training plus fine-tuning numbers, uh, even if you try to do all these tricks and. I think it's simply because the unsupervised pre-training methods, like like contrastive pre-training, they, they're just learning a lot more about the data than uh, than just regular supervised learning. So they're able to generalize better to the validation set uh, compared to just regular supervised learning. Uh, I, I'm not saying that the training performance is better. Like like if you look at the training set accuracies, so like uh, pre-training is not supposed to help you over there. Uh, but 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 you throw a new validation set, it's it's very likely to help you. Um, not significantly. I'm not saying you get five percent gains, but one or two percent you're definitely going to get. And and that is significant at the regimes that we operate in. Like if you look at eighty three percent, eighty one percent, those are really difficult regimes. And um, another paper that comes to my mind is the noisy student paper from from mm -hmm. from Kwakle. Uh, so just by doing this uh, kind of like semi-supervised uh, learning with unlabeled data, uh, they're able to get one, uh, one or two percent more than the state of the art at regimes like 88 percent, 86. And crazy. So uh, I think that's what it's doing. It's basically learning more about the data and therefore it's unlikely to find spurious ways to classify images. and. And therefore, it's likely to generalize better. Yeah, I, th I think that that might be the best way to build intuition about it, because there's a kind of generalization crisis in deep learning. You know, the, the models don't really generalize at all. And this is a, the similar reason why perhaps data augmentation works in supervised classification models, because what you're doing is you're kind of um, you're, 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 you're um, uh, showing the same thing in, in slightly different perturbed ways. And then you're, you're helping the model to generalize slightly better. Only when, when you do it in this new modality, um, you're um, generating a, an auxiliary task without even needing the labels at all. 
Yeah, I think it's also like similar, like it's kind of like the same framework. It's just that the positive key is like one zero zero zero, you know, rather than the other representation of another image. So it's like in supervised learning, you're matching the positive key, which is this one hot class label vector, or maybe like a smoothed out vector. You know, it actually does kind of make sense to me that the representation would then be more semantic in the contrast of learning because you're just kind of like pushing them into those positive keys where they all match. And it doesn't matter like, you know, how different one cat is from another cat, as long as they're in that positive key space of one zero 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 for something like CIFAR 10. Um, it, it, so, so by the way, this result has been shown in multiple papers. Like, even if you look at the appendix paper in Moco, uh, the appendix section, um, they actually try to take the pre-trained image net or Instagram Moco models and fine tune it to the same supervised setup, and they find like 0.5 percent more or like 0.7 percent more. Um, and, and, and it's been shown in CPC, and uh, I'm not sure if SimClear had a result on this, but I would imagine it to work there. Um, so, so I think, I think, I think it's. Uh, so, so let, let's just say that it it may be outrageous in some sense, but not as outrageous as uh, like you know it was like a, back then in those days when you needed to do layer wise pre training because I think back then supervised learning itself was not working. Like you just couldn't train a deep enough model directly on the supervised objective. Uh, now you now that's like something you just take for granted. It's like that's like you know the deep learning success story. Um, what 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 is happening right now is that works. But if you care even more about the numbers, if you want an even better performing model, pre-training is going to be the way to do it. Uh, and that matters, right? Like. Uh, you may think like, oh, what? Well, how does it matter if you get one percent more in the image net? Um, I, like, like think about it in terms of the number of errors you make per hundred images, uh, and number of times the model served for inference, like in a big company like Facebook or Google. Uh, it it just is a huge impact, even for like 0.5, 1 percent improvement. Um, and, and similarly, like in any other computer vision application. So um, I think I think that that's that's how I think about it. It's more like it, it, it just helps you in these final gains like you just need it at the end. And it's also neat in the sense that you can take it and put it in. The transfer learning is also better with a pre-trained backbone than a supervised backbone. With, with, with basically, with an unsupervised pre-trained backbone is better. So that means, like, if you wanna if you wanna improve object detection or semantic segmentation, you would rather do unsupervised pre training than supervised pre training. So and and yeah. Well, on that same topic, uh, what do you think this framework would be stronger if you initialized it with transfer learning? Because it seems like it's a random network at first. It's doing both Moco and Q learning. Is that correct? Yeah, does curl seems to start from scratch and then learn Moco and the Q learning from scratch. Do you think you could take, you know, image net weights and start off with that, or you know, this pipeline that we're talking about? I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect image net to help a lot in in in, in these tasks because these are simulation tasks and um, they look very different from image net images. Um, but, but but that's an interesting idea. Uh, but. In, in real world robot learning, like I think that, that would be pretty interesting to try. Like take take Moco and put it in a grasping robots con net and see how much. So some people actually paper recently from Google Brain on this, like taking pre-trained Coco models, like segmentation models, and putting it on the robot gra robot grasping and seeing some much better, much faster learning. So that, those are interesting things to try when you move to the real world settings. Okay, so um, 
I think Jan LeCun said in a couple of interviews recently that he thinks the you know the next frontier of machine learning is unsupervised learning. I mean, I, I think that's already here. To be honest, it's the most important ticket in town, and it's being used uh, in absolutely everywhere. But um, so, assuming that's a given, I'm, I'm also interested in your opinion about the future of reinforcement learning and, and its utility in, in industry. Yeah, so I think Jan LeCun. Uh, has been saying it for like five years now. Uh, it's amazing Like he just has been pushing for this kind of success that we're seeing right now uh, back in like 2016, uh, even before like supervised learning was as big as it is right now. Um, so, I mean, I think he gave the wholesome picture already, which I really like, which is the Le Cone Cake or the Le Cake, as it's called. <laughs> um, so the uh, if, if intelligence was a cake, unsupervised would be the cake, and supervised would be the uh, ice uh, <laughs> icing and the, <laughs> the cherry. So I think that's really what I believe in too. Like uh, like if you look at curl, like there's a lot more to learn from the contrast to lost and the reward signal. It, it doesn't even have to be the state of the art. You know, like if, when we have the right kind of benchmarks, when you have the right kind of models, uh, these contrastive models are just going to learn a lot more and transfer better, generalize better, learn faster. So that, that I, I just think that's that's the only likely outcome. Uh, it, it may be possible that somebody improves a regular super, supervised model or their regular. Um, like like reward optimization models, but but they're unlikely to in, be useful in the long run. Um, so the same kind of conclusions that happen right now for supervised learning will will also happen for RL, like where you do some kind of pre-training and then fine tune, and then you're better off than just learning with rewards. No matter how much reward signal you get, that that's what I like the most. People can always say like, hey, yeah, sure, you get gains when you don't have a lot of labels. But the, the true thing is you get gains no matter how many labels you have. And I, that kind of success should also happen in our real setting. Like, no matter how, how, how many imitation trajectories you have or no matter how many reward signals you get, just because you have a great cake, it should be possible to learn even better. Uh, and and I think the first signs, for, like the uh, the way I would go about it is, see if somebody can create a large scale imitation learning benchmark, and we can just go out and try these ideas, like pre train and just do supervised learning, make make R L look more like supervised learning there. Um, unfortunately, the best place to try these ideas is like sub driving, um, which cannot be an academic benchmark. Um, so it's best tried in industry where like you have a lot of data of driving data. You do unsupervised pre-training for us, like something like video contrast to learning. And then you fine tune it to like predict different things like pedestrians or traffic signs or whatever. Um, and also like the optimal actions. That system is likely to be much better than just doing supervised learning. Sorry, I, I just have to get it on the record. I was at the Facebook party in Vancouver at Nurips and they did have the cake on the dessert buffet. <laughs> and it, <laughs> I think I have a picture of it. Just, I thought this was funny and I'm pretty sure it was not intentional. And uh, yeah. <laughs> like, I think I think uh, in, in NYU, they Preparation for uh, Jan Lecun on uh, for during war, and I think they had the the cake for on for that celebration. So, um, <laughs> I mean, so the the cake is a bit like pop science, but it's one of the things that is true and also like pretty, pretty, pretty inspiring actually, because you you you, you it, it gets it gets it right. I think like like it, it's fundamentally true. Cool. 
So um, I'm just sort of slightly conscious of the time. So um, could we vaguely finish off by just talking about um, your journey into machine learning? And I'm, I'm really interested just to know how, how someone like you could, uh, you know, obviously develop all of this expertise and uh, were, were you passionate about it from a young age? And, and what's your kind of process now for reading papers? What kind of papers are you reading? How, you know, what, what's, uh, what, what, what's your method for kind of, you know, um, uh, ingesting information? Um, so, so, uh, let's see, I, I started doing machine learning maybe around 2016. Uh, like I, I was undergrad in IIT, uh, in India. Uh, it's one of the engineer, like the, be the best engineering colleges in India. Uh, so you get access to like, like, like whatever is best possible in India. Um, and so uh, the professor who taught me machine learning in 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 ID, uh, he he was uh, he was a student of Andy Bardo, who's one of the uh, considered as one of the fathers of RL. Uh, so he he done his PhD with him, and so he he was working on our reinforcement learning. And so I, I actually start wanted to do research with him, and so he he just told me to work on reinforcement learning. And that was the same time that uh, DeepMind started publishing all these deep RL papers, um, like like DQN, DDQN, and um, dueling DQN. All these, all these kind of different papers. So I just mostly started off by reading DeepMind papers, actually, and and also just trying to understand the other works in the, in, in, in regular deep learning, like. Uh, like like sequence of sequence and potential mechanisms and all that. Um, so it takes a long time actually. The the initial amount of effort you need to put in to understand the basics is so high uh, that it. Uh, I actually have no idea how long it took because it's it's been an ongoing process from 2016. Uh, so then I, I I did some research in RL, uh, like wrote some papers on deep RL. Uh, very simple papers, not not anything fancy, uh, and 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 then that that got, got me an admit into Berkeley uh, for for a PhD uh, with Peter Beal, uh, who's my advisor, and he's he's one of the uh, world renowned experts on deep RL uh, and robotics. So so after that, I started working on um, like like regular deep RL with him, and then. Uh, there were a few students in his in his lab who were more interested in um, unsupervised learning, um, generative models, and so that's how we actually start off uh, working on it. And we we actually have an ongoing class on that, like it's been going on for a couple of years now, um, called Deep Unsupervised Learning from Berkeley, CS two nine four one five eight. So the best way to learn a topic is to try to teach it, right? So we. We actually just learned a lot of the generative models and self supervised learning just because we had to teach it. And you can't teach it unless you know something. So you, you learn it that way, you're forced to learn. And also by implementing all these models, like there's no easy way, like you just have to keep trying to implement these models yourself. Uh, and then uh, I also did internships, like in my first year summer intern at OpenAI with John Schulman and then worked on proximal policy optimization algorithms with him. And I also happened to, I got a chance to see, like, those were the beginning days of unsupervised, I would say, like the modern unsupervised, like Alec Radford was making progress with GPT-1. And so Ilya Sutskever had a huge influence on me in terms of convincing that unsupervised is a way to go. Um, and that's when we actually started taking it more seriously and shifted from regular mainstream RL. And then I uh, was interested in this contrastive predictive coding framework and uh, interned with Aaron Van Den Yord at DeepMind. He's the inventor of CPC and uh, WaveNets, WikiVAE, all these models. Uh, so learned a lot from him actually. He uh, and we did the CPC version two paper. Uh, and after that, like I've just been continuing on this path, like trying to do more on schools. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that that's that's pretty much it. Like we've, we've just been trying to 
I think right now I'm just planning to work on unsupervised learning in the near future. Generative models and supervised learning, like making sure it helps in supervised or RL those frameworks. Hmm. Okay. Any more questions, Connor and Yannick? I don't know. I think we had a pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, um, Aravind, this has been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously there's the, the whole Reddit community, uh, I'm sure are going to uh, absolutely love this. So, um, yeah, I, I hope you come back and talk to us again soon. And I, I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, it was great, great, great uh, chatting about all this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Cool. Yeah.